There was an interesting trend in desktop Linux last year, especially in the last few months, and that was Fedora, a free and open source operating system backed by Red Hat, uh, enjoyed a lot of positive press from uh, hardcore Linux aficionados and uh, new users as well. So what was it about the release of Fedora 33 that sparked this positive hype train? Because it's not like Ubuntu, MX Linux, OpenSUSE, Arch, PopOS, a bunch of other systems had a great year for their releases as well. What was it about Fedora 33 that seemed to switch even the most hardcore users from around the Linux community? Now, what I do want to say right at the top here is I'm not saying that Fedora somehow became the default Linux installation for desktop users, but it definitely did seem to garner a lot of attention. And I want to try and discuss why I think that has been the case with Fedora 33. So buckle up, let's see what we can find out. Oh, by the way, the in the background, we're just going to be mucking around a little bit with uh, the cinnamon spin of Fedora 33, just for a little bit of light entertainment as we go. Let's get into this. Okay, so there's four big reasons that I think uh, Fedora has really risen to uh, the top of the desktop Linux game uh, since their Fedora 33 release. And the reason number one is consistent innovation without sacrificing quality. Now, what I mean by this is that I think that Fedora has, uh, has always excelled in pursuing innovation on the Linux desktop regardless. But I think what they've managed to nail in the last couple of releases and Fedora 33 especially is pushing that innovation forward. Things like the BTRFS file system, things like making vast improvements with the Wayland uh, uh, display manager without the sacrifice of quality in that a regular user or even a more serious user who doesn't really care about innovation as much as they care about having a stable workable usable desktop uh, they just want something that works and i think the balance that fedora has been able to strike in the last few releases and fedora 33 especially was that they were able to ship new and exciting technical features without sacrificing the underpinnings or the quality that underpins the desktop itself and this is a big deal for a lot of people because it's actually kind of hard to strike that balance uh, oftentimes we'll see with uh, distributions like Ubuntu, which are arguably some of the largest, one of the largest Linux desktops out there, uh, they will oftentimes prefer to err on the side of stability than they will on technical innovation. Now, uh, Fedora obviously being a more leading edge distribution, notice I didn't say bleeding edge because it's a bit of a mixed release model that we'll get to in a second. I think this year they were really able to impress a lot of longtime Linux users with A, being able to try out new stuff, but B, have a very stable and consistent desktop to work with. Now, when we're looking at the release model of how Fedora works as an operating system, you kind of get a sense of how they've been able to strike that balance. A lot of uh, Linux aficionados love the fact that when Fedora puts out a release, you're not limited to that version of the Linux kernel. Uh, you will get updates to the Linux kernel and to other Mesa drivers, etc. Uh, as the update rolls on for that particular release, you're not uh, forced to use an older kernel for the lifetime of uh, the desktop. But it's not exactly a rolling release either, because in a few months time, there'll be a new version of uh, Fedora, Fedora 34, presumably. And, uh, and that will have a bunch of new desktop features to play around with, as well as some new technical innovations. Okay, so what else is there? Before we get into it, if you are new around here, then definitely hit the subscribe button. Go check out the rest of the channel. My channel is all about showcasing alternatives in using free and open source software a lot of the time. So if you're looking to make the switch to Linux in 2021, then uh, definitely go check out the channel and see what it has to offer you. Hit the subscribe button and uh, yeah, let's move on. Well, I think the second biggest reason that this release of Fedora garnered a lot of attention was because of the big hardware partnerships that were announced. Now, nearly every uh, niche Linux hardware manufacturer can offer Fedora as an installable option on their hardware. However, when it was announced that Lenovo was going to be uh, shipping Fedora on a selection of their ThinkPad machines, 
uh, the community really sat up and paid attention. Not only that, but the Fedora version that was being shipped on said laptops was the stock out of the box Fedora ISO without any weird blobs installed on the hardware. It was pure Fedora as Fedora shipped it. And uh, this was critical because what this allows Fedora to do is uh, all of the upstream work that gets done on the Fedora project will then trickle downstream directly to the laptops that run it. In this case, a lot of uh, Lenovo's ThinkPads. This is an exciting win for the open source community because for once we weren't reliant on the, uh, the manufacturer to have updates available and to support a new release of Fedora. We can pretty much be guaranteed that future versions of Fedora will be immediately supported on the hardware because the hardware doesn't require any specific software to run well. So reason number three, and I think this is actually a key to where we stand at the beginning of 2021. And that is that Fedora has consistently and unwaveringly uh, supported the values of free and open source software. This is a really, really hard line to tow because if you want more users to come and use your desktop. You have to have technical merit and also uh, moral ethical merit over the other options out there. Now for free and open source software enthusiasts, the, um, the moral ethical merit of Fedora is that they ship their operating system with no proprietary software on it whatsoever. Nothing that goes on the Fedora ISO is got any weird licensing at all. It's all free as in Libre, open source software. And that's very important for a lot of people. Uh, on the opposite side of that coin though, you have the fact that software has to be usable. And a lot of people rely on their operating system to be able to work with Nvidia drivers or their wireless card or whatever it is. So where does that leave us? Well, again, I think Fedora has been able to finesse a really workable solution. In that, when you open up and install Fedora for the first time, uh, a lot of the proprietary software is not available in the software manager uh, anywhere. On the classic workstation GNOME version of Fedora, they do make it relatively easy to go and enable the repositories that you need to go and get NVIDIA drivers to go and get uh, proprietary software or software that just has some uh, more proprietary leaning or possibly patented uh, software such as Codex and the like. So again, the idea being that you don't want to stop the user from being able to go get those things if they desire, but as a core operating system, they don't ship with any of those things. And they will always make a choice to uphold the values of free and open source software over that of their user base. So reason number four for Fedora's uh, prominence in the Linux circles that I've been in over the last few months. And that is the large community presence that Fedora has had around these different media circles. Key members of the Fedora community and their development team have been present uh, at various uh, online meetups and uh, different uh, YouTube channels, different Linux podcasts, uh, to voice their excitement and their enthusiasm for the Fedora project. And that has a rub off effect. It's a little bit like free advertising for a product that's not making any money anyway. You get my drift. When people get excited about something, they want to go and see what all the fuss is about. And if the quality of the software itself can stand on its own merit, then those people will be convinced to uh, run that on a regular basis. And I think that's what's happened uh, a lot this year with the Fedora project. Uh, the greater Linux loving public have benefited from that just by getting excited about the same things that the other Fedora team and the community is excited about. Now, I guess the great irony in all this is that uh, on the flip side of Red Hat's uh, Linux offerings, you have CentOS that has undergone a lot of upheaval over the last few months. And uh, so we have two very polarizing sides of the same Red Hat coin. On one hand, you've got Fedora, which seems to be the darling of the Linux and open source community right now. And you have CentOS, which is, is ruffling a lot of feathers with the announcement that they made. Well, let me know what you think about Fedora and its rise to prominence uh, over the last few months or so. Uh, and again, this is very much a potentially a uh, storm in a teacup situation where it might not necessarily be the darling of the Linux media world, I should say, uh, because I'm talking very much here about my own echo chamber as opposed to your real world experience. But uh, 
uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. And uh, Fedora definitely has been churning out some quality releases for some time and they deserve to be a flagship operating system of the free and open source software world. So those are my two cents. Let me know yours. I'll see you all in the next one.